you, Joe. Well, 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 well. Ooh, it makes it sound like a party. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this fine radio program, podcast, and video extravaganza known internationally Hi, as Mom. the world famous smoking and toasting. I love our guest reactions when you do that. Like he was not well, prepared for yeah, that. Did you see the look yeah, on his yeah, face? Some people are prepared. Other people are like, <laughs> "Okay, what, just what did I agree to do? Why? Why did they book me onto this? I've got to talk to my people. Uh, I didn't pregame enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our guest today on smoking and toasting number two hundred and twenty nine is uh, a first time guest, Aaron Inkrot, who is the innovation manager for St. Arnold Brewery right here in our own hometown That's of Houston. Awesome job title. Yeah, you got a li- innovation manager. We'll get to that because I gotta I gotta figure how you get that cool of a job title. But right. uh, but we will uh, we will get to that. In the meantime, uh, you know, as as all of our favorite guests do, Aaron has brought libations. So we're we're really Yes, we're really excited. Aaron, you'll learn some things about about us on the show today. One is that when it comes to production value and and uh, sound effects and things of that nature, uh, here at Smoking and Toasting, we spare every expense. So uh, so you'll you'll be uh, you'll be happy to know that we haven't gone well out of our way to uh, to try to beef things up here. Welcome to the show. It's show number two hundred and twenty nine, which means we are what in about uh, halfway to three hundred. Halfway to three hundred. Yeah. yeah, about right. Uh, it is a uh, a pretty exciting day. We'll talk about innovation from St. Arnold, and we'll talk about the best bourbons of the twenty first century. So far, we have to see if we agree with them. Yeah, that's right. I, uh, or if we've tried any of them. I've been some saving... of those lists. You know, they have like they have like thirty different uh, uh, different spirits on there. And you're like, I've I've heard of like two. Yeah, are, right. they, are they all here? <laughs> no. Although what we wah, do wah. have, we see he's right right in step with us on the sound effects. See, right. Did you hear that? He's, I he, have one of those. He, Hold you on. Picked, you picked that up. Yeah, you picked that up really quickly, so that's good. I, I uh, could let you run this if you'd like. No, we, we won't be trying all uh, all of the best bourbons, supposedly, of the 21st century, but we will be trying some Espanita tequila. It looks like you've already tried I this. I think there may have been a little trying going on here, yes, uh, already. This is not your it's least tough. favorite on the shelf, so I see. It, it can be tough. Uh, sometimes I will go into specs and I think, okay, I need to buy a spirit for the show. And I thought we haven't had a tequila in a little while. Let's try a tequila. And for whatever reason, the tequilas seem harder to stay away from between the time I buy them and the time that I bring them in. To the show, I than, have that problem with some other bourbon spirits. on my shelf. Yeah, yeah, it just keeps right. going away. Yes, yeah. There's definitely a hole in this bottle, so uh, we'll we'll get to it's, we'll get it's to a little evaporative bit of that. nature. Yeah, but uh, this is uh, a tequila I had never heard of. Just saw it on the shelf and thought, okay, I'll bite. You know, how bad can it be? It's tequila. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so excited about uh, tasting that. Excited about trying some different things from St. Arnold. I can see by the can you set next to me here that we will be uh, tasting this uh, H-Town Pills. And I got to tell you, I've had this, and it's it's now on my regular beer uh, we had that on the show a while we back. We did, we did. Yes. So we'll be tasting that again, and then I didn't see what the bottles were, but we'll be excited to get to that. A couple of bombers over here, uh, Ian, that look... Well, just uh, there's something about a bomber, you know. Even yes. even when you don't know what these are in actually it. 500 mils. Okay, so. so they're not quite bomber size, right? Yeah. A little bit more. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, see, look look how fancy that looks. Yeah. I love you this much. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. So we'll be tasting all of that on the show today. We will, of course, have uh, have drinking news. Uh, our drinking news teaser headline for the day, uh, and you're going to give me a little musical. You know, it always distracts me when you do that, but I love it. Uh, our headline for today, on second thought, a cold sandwich would be fine. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll get to that. Drinking news, uh, Aaron, is a segment we do here on the show that uh, uh, is passing along news stories that we at least believe to be true. Uh, that are sometimes, but not always, about drinking, but generally are m- most and best enjoyed when you are drinking so uh so that we'll get to and by the time we get to it we'll have already been drinking so that'll be a, that'll be a a really good thing a couple of interesting things in the news uh, there's been a fire in honduras that took out a whole bunch of alec bradley tobacco oh no yeah yeah although the only thing i can think about that is that as sad as it is think how wondrous it would have been 
to have been standing like on a hilltop close Best by. smelling <laughs> wildfire yeah, ever. Exactly. Uh, so we'll tell you about that. Uh, Cigar Aficionado's got 10 smokes to light up spring. We'll try to get to that. Uh, U.S. Uh, craft beer production was down in 2020, but stronger than anticipated. We talked about that a little bit last uh, last week, and we'll maybe get to some of those figures today. And um, it's, it's really, I'm looking forward actually to getting into this list of the best bourbons of the 21st century so far because it's from the Rob Report. And as you know, the Rob Report is a magazine that is subscribed to by about 5% of their subscribers are the incredibly wealthy people that right. own their own planes and, and where money is no object for whatever, you know, cigars or bourbon or whatever they're drinking. And then the other 95% is people that, Wish they were that, they were that and that they people. like having it on the coffee table because it looks kind of you know kind of cool. So Rob reports always uh, always kind of interesting. So uh, so Aaron uh, St. Arnold. I, I by the way, I was so proud. Uh, we did a list on the show a couple of weeks ago about the fifty U.S. breweries that. Uh, 50 U.S. craft breweries that sold the most beer. And St. Arnold was the only Texas brewery on there. But we were so proud that that Houston, our hometown, was represented there and that you guys were on the list. St. Arnold is considered a mid-size brewery. Is that right, when they classify these things? <clears throat> yeah. So there's the Brewers Association kind of bases up bases it off of total volume produced yeah and there's for us it's we are a mid-sized regional craft brewery based okay. off because we sell fifteen thousand barrels or more and you won best regional craft or mid-sized craft brewery uh, 20, a couple of years back right 2017 yeah, yeah which nice. I, I remember seeing the billboard the art car billboard and the uh that was, and, and the thing that always made me like really happy when i, when I drove past it i know? was fortunate to be at the the great american beer festival for that and was able to Hear, hear our name and walk on the stage and Brock will tell you the story of him of me slapping his back because I was so excited and he says he still the handprint is still the on his back. Still on, I believe it. Uh, I, I believe I, there it, was so. celebratory beers that evening. I bet. Now I've been. In, it was not a dull night. I've been. In, uh, I've been in your brewery way back when you guys were over in the industrial park. Yes. And the. To think back then that you would wind up being on this list of the fifty biggest craft brewery, it, it's kind of a it's kind of a neat thought because everything was so small there compared. I mean, you've got much more room now in your yeah. location, but it's uh, you've grown quite a bit, is what I'm getting we, at. Yeah, we have. It's it's been a nice kind of organized growth. Um, there's definitely some other breweries that have had some exponential growth, but. Um, we want to make sure that we're growing at a pace that we can that you, you can know, sustain. sustain. Yes, and, absolutely. You know, I mean. In a business side, obviously, you don't want to take on an, an excessive amount of debt, and then if you don't right. end up growing, sure, because sometimes you you can grow too fast, yeah, and then you are thinking that you're going to continue to grow at that pace, and you it, it can be hard to to pace things properly in terms of end expenses. Up quite and upside things. down, that yeah, way. Absolutely. No, there's, absolutely. There's definitely several examples within our industry that breweries have been over leveraged by and, what they took on loan wise and you guys and, and if this is something that it's not cool to talk about that's fine you don't have to answer but in all of the acquisitions that have taken place over the past several years where craft breweries have been purchased by big beer and and you know conglomerates and stuff it did you guys get approached and say no or did did you just give off that air of look we got our own thing going don't even try uh, Brock won't shy away from a question like that. He, we, I mean, there's def, definitely been offers on the table. I'm and sure. I mean, as, I mean, pre Carbach in Houston, I mean, we were the largest in Texas for a long time. Right. And there was always that interest for sure. But Brock was always adamant of being independent. He wants to be the own. I mean, he wants to be the owner of the brewery for. He's, I think, what is he, 54, 55 years old? So he's still young in terms of, you know, being an entrepreneur. So. Yeah. He sees himself being in it for as it's, long as he can go. It I would seems imagine. to me that if you can, I mean, and I have no issue with people, you know, f chasing the American dream and you know making lots of money by selling their business. But from a beer lover standpoint, it it's heartening to us because we know that ultimately Brock is the guy that's going to say, "This is how we're going to make this beer. This yeah. is what we're going to price this beer. This is." This is the quality level that I'm going to hold things to. And um, once you're a part of a big corporation, 
it's not always the brewmaster or the the head of the brewery that that gets to make those decisions. You know, I mean, I think the best analogy for it is. It's like going to a restaurant where you know the chef. You know who's making the food, right. and you, you can trust the product, and you know that the quality is going to be good. And if, if, if you do have an issue with it, please email the brewery. I mean, yeah. we're not shy from those comments, and we, we definitely respond to all of them. You can get a good burger at Red Robin. Yes. But when you get one that you know has been really handcrafted by the chef, and you just, it's just a different feeling, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, you know, Ian and I say this all the time, we don't... We don't begrudge anybody making their money by, you know, by selling, but we'd much rather put our money into the pockets of the true independent guys yes. than than to put it in the pockets of uh, AB or Miller. Speaking Court. of which, I hope you've uh, felt the the financial bump over there at St. Arnold's. I've been trying to drink every bit of Springbok that I can find. <laughs> yeah, please please keep going. Yes, <laughs> that, that, that really is a wonder. You know, there's several Working hard at that. There are several of your seasonal beers that we get really excited. Springbok is one, and the other is the October Oktoberfest. I mean, is man, that's a great beer. It really, really, it, and it's great to live in a in a, a town where there's a seasonal that comes out that you look forward to that that wonderful moment when you see it on the shelf at the store. You're like, it's out. Oh it's, yeah, it's it's uh, April. Oktoberfest when, is here. You know, when it comes to St. Arnold's, I I literally bounce from seasonal to seasonal. I love all the seasonals. Yeah, I, yeah. the the Springbok, the Summer Pills, the Oktoberfest. Although the, you'll pardon me if I put in a plug for you guys, please consider bringing back my favorite seasonal that you don't make anymore which was the sailing santa that was a one-off like, was it we, really i mean we only made a very small batch of it we it, made a one it was a single 240 barrel batch so our fermenters are 240 barrels so it was your your winter beer your your christmas ale with christmas ale with, with Alyssa. Alyssa. yeah and so there was what was it i don't know 2016 Alyssa was their original ipa by yeah, the way. yeah and and we blend it 50 50 blend with christmas ale but there was one year where it was it was extra special and it was there was a, a hop a hop grower up in the uh, pacific northwest that created what was called the snap hop where they would blend spices with with a hop and that's what we did on the first release of sailing sand and we released it in a 22 ounce bomber and it was it was excellent it, it was, really it, was, was. it was really good but I will say I've tried just combining the two, you know, by buying, and it's okay, but it's not the same. Yeah, and that Snap Hop, they only made, they only produce it for that one year, and I mean, like anything that it doesn't sell as well as other products, yeah. so they'll discontinue it. So unfortunately, they don't make that hop anymore. So and, we we yeah, talked with Lady- Alyssa years ago. They used to have up at uh, the Ginger Man. They used to have the cast conditioned Alyssa yeah. up there. Yeah, that was I when I moved to Houston. When I moved to Houston, Amazing. that was the first. Like real craft beer, I got into when I came here was the cast condition, uh, Alyssa. It was so good, and I yeah. fell in love. Like this is, yeah. It was that kind of epiphany when you come to uh, a beverage or a love beer. it. I love when that happens. Yeah. Now, when uh, we asked uh, Lenny about this when we had him on the show, uh, but there was a time when you guys would multiple times a year cause commotion at every store that sold uh, beer and, and wine with the release of your specialty beers divine of the divine reserve, reserve. Yeah. and uh, and that's not something that you're that you've continued to do what what made you take something that was that big of a deal and decide to rest it like all things it's a novelty tends to um, tends to wear off a little tends bit to wear off yeah. and we were one of four or five breweries in Houston at the time and the whole hunt for the beer Mm -hmm. (laughs) just drifted. And as more breweries came into Houston from all over the country that I remember when I first started on a craft beer, I would trade for beer all over the country that I couldn't get. But now all those hard to get beers, they're sitting on our shelves. Right, right. And I think the last couple divine reserves that we had, we, we, that we produced in the same amount of volume that we had always had, were just sitting on the shelf. And not not necessarily because the quality was any different, or but there was so much more for people to choose from. Yeah, there's that so much Baltic more. Porter yeah. was brilliant. Mm, really was. Thank you for saying that, <laughs> because that was one offering that didn't like people don't go crazy for. But in my opinion, was one of the best beers we have ever released. That was absolutely brilliant. Like, it really was. It, I think I have one bottle left. Oh, uh, it's house. A, it's such a beautiful beer. It like the whole style of the Baltic Porter is kind of misunderstood it to some degree and and i and the way i kind of present it in tastings is 
you have you compare it to a Russian imperial stout, and I always describe it as a kid with a, a kid with a coloring book or an adult with a coloring book. A Russian imperial stout is like a kid with a coloring book. They're all all the flavors are kind of out of the lines. There's, it's either heavily, heavily roasted chocolate, bitterness, all this other stuff. But the Baltic Porter, very refined. It's an adult with a coloring book, and it stays in the lines, and it's very focused flavors of baker's chocolate, nice clean finish, and it's just it's. It's the perfect dark high alcohol that, beer. That was one of my absolute favorites. Love you guys it, did. love it. And it's a great analogy too. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite. Yeah. Definitely. And we we aged it in port barrels too, yeah. which was it was a money beer. It's like yeah. when I was a kid and I would color and I would there would be a, a airplane and I would just put blue all over it and then my mom would you know sit down and color with me. Only her stuff looked like an artist had done. Yeah. You know, it was like it was like the same the same picture. Uh, well, that, this is really exciting and I, and I know you've brought some of these uh, some of these bottles to taste and I'm really excited to get into some of those as well. And we will do that. We've got a lot to go over on the show today. Uh, Ian, I'm assuming. Because it's usually safe to assume that you've had the opportunity during the week or perhaps even today before the show to enjoy a cigar that you'd like to uh, talk to us about. I did. Uh, a friend of mine uh, laid a cigar on me the other evening. So um, he uh, he almost lost a foot in a motorcycle accident. So oh, we referred man. to him as Footloose. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but his, his foot wound oh, up yeah, being he's okay? Fine. Yeah, he's okay. Fine. But Footloose is still a great well, name. Footloose gave me a cigar. <laughs> and it also puts also puts that vision in my brain of Kevin Bacon <laughs> doing that slidey thing that he does. That's that's a, that guy can dance, man. Yeah, so, we, so we call him Footloose. Anyway, he gave me this uh, is uh, uh, El Credito. Ah, have you ever seen this? I, I isn't El Credito like a super old line yes. of cigars? Like yes, and I, I don't think, think of uh, it as a super premium. I think it's uh, EPC that owns it. I can't. Okay. I, I'd have to look it up to remember. But the size that I had was the El Perro. This is uh, which means the dog. The dog, yes. Um, and this is a five that's by Spanish five for by the Perro. That's right. It's Spanish <laughs> for the Perro. Um, this is a five by thirty-eight. So it's a it's a pretty small cigar overall. Yeah. Five and a half by thirty-eight. Uh, Ecuador, uh, Ecuador Habano wrapper, Connecticut binder, Nicaraguan filler. The appearance is rustic to say the least. Mm -hmm. My notes are rustic, veiny, lumpy and uneven, leathery, firm, uh, and it's a simple, super simple band on it. Just says, um, it just says El Credito. Yeah, I think of it almost like the cigars that that uh, Clint Eastwood smoked in the right. Good, the Bad, the it Ugly. Is, it that, is a hand rolled yeah. cigar, and it is an ugly. <laughs> it's an ugly cigar. I just <laughs> pointed out, uh, but yeah, it does look very much like that. Um, yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks pretty basic. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to make sure that you could see how lumpy and ridiculous yeah, well, it was. Yeah, right? in the in the picture that so, Adam's uh, got up a bit. You, you're right. That's, right. So um, it's not a pretty stick. The pre light sniff. There wasn't a whole lot to it. There was this <laughs> classic tobacco and some wood. That's pretty much as far as I got on the pre light sniff. The pre light draw. This thing is pre clipped or it doesn't have a cap in the first place. One of the two. Um, and so I didn't have to do anything. The pre light draw was medium draw. Um, earth and hay, natural sugar sweetness on the lips, slight coffee kind of taste going on. And then I lit it, and there was a hint of harsh chemical right off the bat. Ooh, that's not good. And then it immediately went away. Oh, well, that's good. It was very weird. It was huh. like, was that there? Just a tiny little hint of that, and then it went away. Uh, now, I've had cigars where that's persisted and did not enjoy those cigars. This was there and gone, just like that. So I don't know what that's from, but that's what happened. Um, uh, I said, uh, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll do this exactly as I wrote because I was having a little fun with it, apparently. Uh, a hint of harsh chemical, which immediately disappeared, followed by a preposterous peppery punch and a protagonistic plumes of pleasurable smoke. Oh, you are you are Hemingway today. Man, I was oh, alliterating yes. like a beast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, Love it. The first third of this peppery smoke. Spicy, coffee, slightly sweet, big pepper retrohale, like almost burn the nose kind of peppery <laughs> yeah. retrohale. This is not a, a lightweight cigar. This is in medium to medium full range, definitely. Um, it was. It didn't smoke as fast as I thought. It, it a yeah, you're kind of gauge. expecting one that looks like I that. I expected this fast. to be a 20 minute smoke at best, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I guess since it's a long filler, it's not short fill uh, cigar or anything. I guess it just. It just took its time burning. Uh, solid ash, perfect burn. 
Wow. No, like, no problems with that. Uh, by the second third of this, the ash hadn't fallen yet. It got crooked and weird, but it was still stuck to the cigar. I'm looking at your shirt. It looks clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't fall on me. Uh the the draw became a little bit tight at this point, so I, I gently rolled the end of the cigar with my fingertips, mm -hmm. um, and it opened the draw right up, but it also inadvertently knocked the ash off the cigar, so it finally fell off. Um, it settled into a medium plus strength, picks up some cedar to add to the spicy pepper and coffee already present. Retrohale calms down and becomes pleasant pepper and wood. A rich earthiness kind of runs throughout it. Solid ash, perfect burn. Nice. I mean, this thing burned oddly well. Uh, again, burning substantially longer than I predicted. By this time, I was 25 to almost 30 minutes in it, mm. in a cigar this size. Um, sweetness has changed to a raw turbinado sugar kind of thing. The uh, cigar went out on me. Uh-oh. It just Boom, and done. it was gone. So I tipped the ash off of it and relit it. There was a slight penalty in a form of bitterness that started to become harsh a little bit at the very end of the cigar. Uh, all that in mind... Um, this thing burnt for almost 45 minutes, uh, which was mm. bizarre because it's not very big. Yeah, I would have expected um, 20. The price on this cigar, however, is $2.46, as mm -hmm. you can buy it for, like, say, $123 for a bundle of 50 Okay. So when you break it down to $2.46, I give it a five. Yeah. It's fine. You got your 2 bucks and 45 yes, cents out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually got this one for free, so it was even better than yeah. that free. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, I was surprised. It was, a, it was a not a bad little cigar, and it was ugly, and it was terrible looking. I expected the absolute worst out of it. And, but uh, it wasn't and, bad. And it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, it was all right. It was, it was a good smoke. So, Aaron, our, our grading system when we do our cigar tastings, uh, we call it the price to quality scale. And it's a one to 10 scale, but if we give something a five, it means means it you got exactly what you paid for so if it's over a five it's like you know even if this had been more it would have been worth it and if it's under a five and a lot of really expensive cigars have trouble getting over a five from us even if they're really good if they were eighteen dollars it's they it better, better be, be good, really yeah. good yeah. exactly <laughs> so so it's uh, so it's kind of how we do things so for it to get a five is not bad i will mention that one of the highest scoring cigars we've ever had was when ian smoked a black and mild and gave it a nine because it's a sub one dollar cigar right. that I enjoyed the shit out of for twenty minutes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I was Did you break it apart and add something beer. else to it? What's that? Did you break it apart and add something <laughs> else to it? No, <laughs> there was none of that. But, but you know, that, that's it's one of those odd things because it's a price to quality thing. Right. I don't think oh, a black yeah. and mild is an amazing cigar. Right. But bang for the buck, and the fact that I was sitting there having you know beers and stuff with friends, and my friend left it, it on the table for me. He right? goes, "Hey, I bought you a cigar." It was kind of a joke, and I was oh, like, "I'll smoke it." And uh, and it was fine. Yeah, I love it. You know, and love for it. something you can get for seventy nine cents, you gotta love it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the same thing applies to all things consumable <clears throat> in this world when yeah. it comes yeah. to. Yeah, I, I mean, think you're right. Absolutely, there's a, there's a price to quality. Although I will say, with beers, sometimes if you go below a certain point, it's just not worth having. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a time and a place. Which which reminds me, uh, Chris Hart keeps t texting me, and you. About Montucky Cold Snack. It's Ugh, like he's trying to terrible. talk us into saying that it's Have good. Have you tried this thing? I'm very familiar with it. It's, it's not just, good. Just like, not I, don't a fan. You, I don't know if you like it or not, but man, it's not good. And I'm not a beer snob. Like, I'll, I'll drink you know, I, a, a mainstream beer if that's all that's available, but... I won't buy it for my own house, but if I'm at somebody else's house or I'm if, I'm if I'm at a dive bar and they have it and they don't have Lone Star, then I'll probably drink. See, Montucky. I'd much oh. rather have a Lone Star. Yeah, I like, would. not, not I would. even close. Like, there's, I'm getting ready to go to the Outer Banks with my family and... I used to try to get my my uh, wife's family into you know craft beer, but mm -hmm. Uncle Dale he won't have it. He drinks Bud Heavy, and that's the <laughs> only thing he'll drink. He's a he's been a mechanic his whole life. His hands are cal more callous than a cat's paw, so it's just like he only drinks Bud Bud Heavy and smokes his Marble what? Reds. Is, is Bud Heavy? Uh, does that's Budweiser the, make a Wee Heavy? Is that what? They no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's no, just I'm it's just right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, I'm like, but over the years, it's like you know what? I don't drink Budweiser, but when I'm with Uncle Dale. That's what you drink. That's what I drink. Yeah. You know, uh, we've you, talked about this before. There is a large contingency, contingency of the population where they pick one beer, and that is their and beer. Still they with all they ever drink. Yeah. And I can't imagine with any other consumable product, like food product, that you do that with. Well, I, like, I, who does that with? I, this is the one pizza, and this is all I ever eat, <laughs> right. and it has to have this exact pepperoni on it every single time. Yeah. Well. It, it, like, it doesn't make sense. But that, that kind of stopped around 
Gen X, didn't it? Because that's that's really kind of the first. Um, and I, I guess there's some boomers that got into things, but now, as I'm sure we'll talk about, the trend in craft beer is there's what so do you got options. that's new? Yeah, you know, they're, what do you consumers get that's are they're schizophrenic. They have no idea what they want at yeah. any given time. And I will tell you, if I go someplace and I look at the beer menu, I'm most likely to order the one I haven't tried. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's just oh, I want to try that. Start Let's there. see if it's good. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, we got to take a break. We're going to come back. I'll tell you about my cigar for the week, and we will begin our tasting. I think we'll probably begin yeah. uh, with the H Town Pills, and that's good because I'm thirsty. <laughs> Getting thirsty myself. Uh, we got uh, Aaron from St. Arnold is on the show. He's the innovation manager. We'll find out what that means, and uh, we'll do some tasting, including some Espanita tequila, coming up on Smoking and Toasting. Welcome back. It's Smoking and Toasting. Our program is all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars. We are brought to you by MyCigarShirts.com. Great shirts for cigar lovers on the internet. Easy to order. You ship them right to your house. And they start under 20 bucks. And they're a little snarky, too, which is uh, what Ooh, makes I them fun. I need to uh, augment my summertime collection. Yeah, it's, it, it's shopping. time. It is, it is time. Great, cool shirts for cigar lovers and great gifts for cigar lovers, too, if you've got someone on your gift list who's having a birthday or or whatever so uh welcome back to the show uh in honduras last week uh, near uh yamastran uh there's a farm called la musica which is spanish for the musica and it is a uh, it is a place where a whole lot of tobacco is grown and cured in barns for the alec bradley tobacco company and unfortunately a whole bunch of those barns and a big area of it burned down last week man so, that is so, devastating you know, go buy your alec bradley cigars now because they may have a shortage of tobacco in the in the coming uh, in the coming uh, year or so but uh but hopefully uh you know, the good news is it didn't destroy their whole operation right it was just a part of where some of the tobacco was being grown for their stuff so i'm sure they'll source other tobacco and we'll be uh, it will be they'll be able to stay uh, completely in business the volume so. of tobacco that uh some of those guys deal with is actually like outside my grasp yeah well you think <laughs> about you think about somebody like aj fernandez he makes all of his own cigars and then he makes all these cigars for these other people how much tobacco does that guy have his hands on and good tobacco yeah, too because his stuff is is just so consistently good well, um, speaking of tobacco, I had an interesting cigar uh, this week that I wanted to share with you. It was the Hoya de Monterey El Torcedor. It's a figurado. In fact, it's a very old school looking uh, figurado. And uh, Adam will put the picture up here, but um, it's it's tapered at both ends. You know mm -hmm. that, uh, but it's long, kind of long and thin. It's not a big fat. Cigar, uh, but it's in fact, I think it's about a, a 44 ring gauge. Um, but it is a very old school looking cigar. Now, only a thousand boxes of 20 of this cigar were made, so it's a very limited run. And General Cigar, which owns Hoy de Monterey, they've been working over the past few years to update their brands and, and keep them current, make them you know more interesting to. Um, you know, modern smokers, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, so with Hoyo, they got A.J. Fernandez to do the Amistad line. And then this one's one that they really wanted to go back and, and kind of reach out to the old school smoker and bring them into a, a more current vibe and, and time. Uh, so uh, it's tapered with uh, at both ends with a small foot and a tiny pigtail cap on the head. I didn't even see it when I bought the cigar. It wasn't until I went to to clip it that I was like, "Oh, there's a pigtail on there." That's so <laughs> because it's so small. Now I will say, if you smoke one of these, don't just do, go snip it. You're going to need to because even if you pull that pigtail off, you're not going to get enough yeah, air yeah, through there. Uh, so anyway, uh, an Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper, a Nicaraguan binder, and fillers from Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. I got hay and a hint of green tea on the pre-light. Very nice. Um, so again, I didn't twist the pigtail. I used my cigar scissors, but uh, but I, I thought well, this is interesting. I cut just above. The pigtail, and as it turns out, um, 
it was a good thing I went a little further up because it, it was a struggle to get the cigar lit. It's tapered at the foot, so you got to get it burned right. far enough in that you that you can pull more well, air and, through. And when it's tapered at the foot like that, or if it has a closed foot, yeah. you can't judge the draw until, until it opens up. It's lit. Right. <laughs> so I was struggling with it. I uh, I had to clip it again further up to get a little more. I used the cigar scissors, and, and uh, finally, after... Maybe the first quarter of an inch of the cigar, it was like boom, and then it drew perfectly. Yeah. But it's a little struggle at first, but it wound up being uh, being worth it. I was beginning to think it was going to get about a two or a three on the <laughs> price to quality because I, I, I really, I really have, have gotten to the point where if a cigar has a tough draw, that's almost the worst flaw for me because I don't want to fight with it the yeah. whole time. The whole idea is to sit back and enjoy, you know? So uh, anyway, uh, once it opened up, the draw was perfect, A+. Uh, cedar, dark fruit were the dominant uh, flavors once I was able to pull through enough to get it on my palate. Uh, nice complexity, some black pepper. And uh, the second, third, it really had settled in at that point. Um, I got some toast and tea leaf on the retro hail. Uh, the burn got a little crooked, but nothing to worry about. I think I touched it up one time, but nothing, uh, nothing big. Uh, the El Torcedor got earthier as it smoked, which also was really nice as it kind of changed and became even more complex. It stayed rich and flavorful all the way through the final third. Cedar and pepper kind of rounding out the last part of the cigar. Uh, medium bodied in the beginning, but it sort of slowly moved towards full mm -hmm. as it as it smoked. Um, I'm inclined not to penalize the cigar at all uh, for the slow start. It's not uncommon with that shape, and I should have clipped it further up to begin with. So it was really, really my fault that it didn't light better. But once it did, it was excellent all the way through. Really enjoyed the cigar. A, kind of a nice change of pace for me from what I usually mm -hmm. smoke, but still enjoyed every bit as much it is about a 12 dollar cigar i loved it thumbs up recommended at price to quality 5.5 just nice just a little at over dollars yeah yeah. Ju yeah just a little over at 12 this is an eight dollar cigar to give it a seven i mean nice. it's just it was that good it was really well i will really tell you oh de monterey their dark sumatra is mm -hmm. a classic it really is cigar. yes yes yeah, it is good. and the amistad line that mm -hmm. that AJ the amistad did. black is one oh, of my go-to's fantastic yeah, yeah. I absolutely love it so uh we have aaron inkrot from uh saint arnold on the show with us today aaron before you pour, or maybe maybe we should pour and talk. Let's get I, beer. I, I'm yeah, let's, let's yes. do some beer. Um, as you pour, if you want to pour us some, uh, uh, oh yeah, see, he has picked up on our he sound knows. effects. It's, he totally knows how we like to. He will know our ways like to run. as yeah. if they were his own. <laughs> Is that what is it? Is is that from a particular? Uh, that's, movie a, that's, a, that's a very geeky. Dune it's a very reference. yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, so so while he's pouring, are you going to see the new Dune movie when it comes out? Yes. It's, you know, um, so the original Dune movie, yeah, such as it was, was was quite scattered. And, yes, and ridiculous. It didn't really make a lot of sense. No. Um, but the acting was amazing, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, Patrick Stewart was in it. Sting was in it. Sting was in it. You know? And uh, Kyle MacLachlan is always um, fun to watch. So. And then uh, Sci-Fi Channel did a miniseries of Dune. And this would have been in the 90s, but I've never been able to find it since. But it was pretty awesome. Yeah, okay. Because the so, book is amazing. Well, and uh, but the book is very dense. Trying to get all that into a movie. Oh, there's so many versions. So, Are there in so such many, a world? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but what I think may give this movie a fighting chance is they're only doing basically half of, of the book, of the mm -hmm. first book. So it might might be okay. Well, they're taking the, the like the the Hobbit stance. Why can yeah. you know we can make one movie and make this much money, or we can turn it into three? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And think how much money they made on those Lord of the Rings movies. Holy well, the Lord cow. of the Rings made more sense because there was yeah. actually three books to begin with. But the yeah. Hobbit was the smallest book of all, and they made three movies out of it. And they made three movies out of it. Uh, yeah. Well, final final thought on movies. Uh, if you do not have HBO Max, at least subscribe for a month because Zack Snyder's Justice League. Is freaking fantastic! It's good. Have to check oh it my out. god, it's good. It's like finally a good DC, DC superhero movie. The only thing that came close was the first, not the second, the first Wonder Woman, and some of the Batman's have been okay. But this is great. You don't qual you don't great. say the Christopher Nolan Batman series is a DC. It, yeah, it's 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 pretty good, and I'm actually kind of a fan of the first Tim Burton 
Batman with Michael Keaton, oh, yeah. too. That was just, I mean, for the time, you go back and watch it now, it feels a little funky. But, uh, by the way, and I said this is going to be all about movies, but uh, Michael Keaton is going to reprise his role as Batman in the upcoming Flash movie. Apparently, I don't even know what to say about that. What? Yeah, I'm I'm all excited. One of my favorite Batman's is Lego Batman. Oh, Lego Batman's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Lego Batman is the I'm best. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I just love his attitude. It's it's good. So Aaron uh, from St. Arnold is here. Aaron, this uh, as we begin to taste the uh, the H Town Pills, um, explain to us exactly how you got the title Innovation Manager, and perhaps more importantly, what do you do as Innovation Manager? Uh, a lot of groveling. Uh, no. Um, so I started out at St. Arnold 10 years ago at, as a shift brewer um, and kind of walk, walk my way up through being a lead brewer. And so we operate 24-5, um, three shifts. And so I started as a shift and then managed a shift. And then we and then uh, eventually came into an operations head brewer and then there was an opportunity that we needed to start releasing more offerings either at the beer garden or in the market. And we didn't have quite a strong focus on R and D. Mm -hmm. Um, so we decided to promote one of our lead brewers into, uh, into the head brewer role, uh, basically take my, take my role. And we've finally put a true focus on to only having an R and D brewer, a research and development brewer, somebody it's, that basically keeps trying new things that's and it. deciding, yeah. hey, we want to try something in this style, and you brew until you get what you yeah. think is, you is small batch. I take it. Yeah, these what are all a small batch. If you, if you're going to do an experimental, you're doing five, ten gallons, fifty yeah, well, gallons. I, mean, it, I don't know what it is. It could be as small as five. We've and then sometimes as big as thirty barrels, um, which is thirty-one gallons in a barrel. Um, but they typically range anywhere between five gallons to about. 40 gallons, just depending on those in that range. So <clears throat> at what point do you go from just tasting the beer yourself to, like, pulling people in and saying, okay, guys, what do you think of this? We have a meeting every Thursday, um, which I had before I came to this, <laughs> and it's our research and development meeting, R&D meeting, and there's, there's 10 people all involved, including myself, and it's managers from sales, marketing, Brock, and and um, a handful of other people um, that taste through everything that I've been working on and that the brewers have been working on. And sometimes there's a specific goal in mind of we think this will fit this style this or we think we style, have a yeah. hole in this kind of place that we can put in the market. Um, or it's just most brewers have just kind of this creative outlet that they want to create something. And sometimes we just bring them something without them asking for it and then we taste it, and then we might get inspired. Okay, to actually let's, do a we should re we should release. This, we should right? release this. Yeah. Yeah. So I would think that your job then is almost the most fun. It is of anybody fun. that that is uh, working at a craft brewery, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, innovation manager is basically a fancy term for re research and development manager. Okay. Um, and it's I get to try out a variety of new raw materials, whether it's hops, barley, um, right. fruit, um, spices, things like that, and or if the head brewer wants to try a new malt to replace an existing brand that we're making in, let's say, Art Car, um, we would need to make sure that we can do an R&D on a small batch scale and ensure that there's no taste difference between. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, I mean, that's part of my job as well. Um, but And then if Brock can't do something like this or at a pre-COVID, like if there was a beer dinner or marketing event, it was I was usually one of those, or Lenny would go do those things, but I get and somewhat of a face of the company, which is also a lot of fun. So it's that's very cool. It's I love you know being passionate about beer and trying to share that passion, and it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So the H Town Pills is a relatively new. This has been on the market for how long now? Uh, just for uh, actually just about a month. Okay. Um, and it's we're it's a brewer's beer. Honestly, it's uh, for any brewer across the world that have you know that it's working in a brew house or a cellar where it's incredibly hot, the last thing you want is a 10% imperial stout. Um, <laughs> yeah. You want something that's... last thing you want, maybe. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's... But 4 or 5% alcohol that's crisp and refreshing and that we can pound. Like, right. honestly, that's what I want. Right, And right. H-Town is kind of inspired. We've been working on this beer for years. And you've seen iterations uh, of its 
of its existence throughout that process. Really? That's interesting. So Icon, the, the Icon series that we had mm -hmm. several years ago, mm -hmm. there was an Icon Red called the yep. Bohemian Pilsner. Then we came out with H-Town Pills. And then this is kind of H-Town replaced 5 o'clock, and it's, there's still a lot of framework from H-Town, or excuse me. From 5 o'clock, yeah. yeah. From 5 o'clock that exists in this. But this has had, obviously, tweaks to it to, cr to create a better beer in our eyes and the one that ultimately we, we feel is, as we kind of tagline on the can, our ideal lager. I, it feels like you found the perfect balance between flavor and crispness, oh, you know, uh, for, for a, a Pilsner like this. You yeah. Know? I'm, I'm thinking back to the 5 o'clock. I remember 5 o'clock having a lot more bitter on the tail end. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. So 5 o'clock was dry hopped, yeah. okay. which, is, which is not common for a Pilsner. Um, but, and then H-Town does not have a dry hop. However, we moved a fair amount of that hops that we would use in the dry hop. We moved it into the brew house <clears throat> to where you can still get that beautiful aroma that we loved in 5 o'clock. But it doesn't have that lingering bitterness that I would say 5 o'clock right. tended to have. It, it, it does is, smell good. It and is definitely more uh, more crushable as a result of that. You know? Absolutely. You, you, it just really has that. It's, it, it's got what I call the Dorito factor, which is <laughs> after you take a sip, I you're see like, you've, you've researched I, I, want, to the I want another sip of this. Uh, you know, it really does. And not all beers are that way. Even beers that I love don't necessarily beg you to take another sip and this one kind of does oh, which is the beauty of alcohol is that it dries your palate mm -hmm. and that that's why you want to keep drinking <laughs> that is a nice and here thing. i thought it was here i thought it was a personal thing <laughs> uh, you know i was i was chalking no, it up to my own personality i have two words with a question mark after it boiler room yes we ever going to see it again well we did release a small amount at the beer garden for sale for cans um there is the framework of it still in existence in, in Raspberry AF. Sure. And that's yeah, delicious, yeah, by the it way. It is good, yes. But Boiler Room, but man, I miss when, Boiler Room. When you could go buy those bombers for like five bucks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, unfortunately, that, wonderful. that, that beer lot, I mean, we screwed up by putting that beer into a bomber. If we put it into cans, then it'd probably still be around. And, mm. um, but the whole mystique of the bomber just kind of dropped. Oh. There were some breweries that went all in on bombers and then. No, they're not doing very well. Well, I know there's like, uh, is it well, Martin House that does, instead of the bomber, they do the two the cans, two cans yeah. in the oh, box, yeah. so it'll which sit is, next to the bomber on the shelf and mm, kind of look big. and Which is very so, clever. Yeah. The bomber, though, the problem with the bomber is it's something you share. Like, right. once you open a bomber, you can't set it back in the fridge and have the rest of it tomorrow. It just right. doesn't work. Right. So, so you're you, committed to it, so you either buy a bomber to share yeah. or you get really drunk, except for something <laughs> like Boiler Room, right. which well, you could drink the whole four thing. 4.5% right. yeah. or... But what's yeah, it was like uh, that, three three point eight percent three point eight percent, which you could crush an entire bomber yeah. of. It was fantastic. I love that beer. But it's kind of weird because nineteen point two ounce cans have been have become incredibly popular. So it's is that so I know the six. I think call them like, the sixteen ounce. No, they, there's there's we call them like like the uh, oh they're the super pipes. tall ones. Yeah, yeah they're, they're the ones. Pipes. They're the ones like you get like when you go, go to, to the, games. the games and yeah. stuff. Yeah, you're like holy moly, like gas stations now, and see, stuff like I that. I don't like those at games. I realize it means you don't have to go back. And get another one as soon. But I hate that they get warm by the end. Well, they should allow you to graduate. You start off with one of those. Yeah. And by the time you're done, you got to pee anyway, so you might as well just right. go get a fresh exactly. beer. Exactly. <laughs> and by that point, you just don't need the bigger beers because you're going to keep going back. Uh, H-Town Pills, is this, a, is this a permanent part of the lineup? Yeah. Now? You're right. That, that is core now. Love it's, that. It's doing really well. Um, we're thankful for that. And uh, I love the... I love the uh, artwork on the can. It really looks well, great. All this, I love all the St. Arnold yeah. cans, but uh, yeah, this is this is a really really good one with the skyline of Houston there, yeah. uh, which is awesome. Okay, we got to take a break. We're going to come back in a moment. We have a short segment. We still have drinking news ahead of us, and we have some more beer to drink. More beer to Yay. drink, which I'm very excited about. So it's smoking and toasting. We are all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars, and we will be right back. Welcome back at Smoking and Toasting. We are so thrilled to have you along for show number 229. We are all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars. And we are brought to you by MyCigarShirts.com. A great shirts on the web for cigar lovers. MyCigarShirts.com because... Cigars. Cigars, yes. Our guest today is Aaron Inkrot. He is the innovation manager for St. Arnold Brewery. Um, you know... Uh, Lenny did a pretty good job when he was on the show, but he was uh, a lot of but, fun. You know, we got the innovation manager now. We're <laughs> we're moving up. What, what was Lenny's title? 
Uh, what is, is he? Chief marketing officer. Chief marketing officer, yeah. yeah. That's I've not known, as fun sounding. No. And I've, I've known Lenny for a while. He's a pretty fun guy, but, you know. He is <laughs> a fun guy. <laughs> and, and, and he did a fine job on the show. But, uh, but now we have the innovation manager, so I'm just saying. <laughs> I definitely have more access to treats than he does. Yeah, there you he go. Can get, he can get you uh, some swag. But it, it reminds me of <laughs> it reminds me of our you know standard answer when people ask what was it that made us decide to start this program two hundred and twenty nine shows ago, and the answer is what was it? Very Chris? simple. Samples. Samples. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that, was, that was the plan then, and it is still the plan now. So when you get the guy on with the really interesting samples. Uh, you know, I don't a, do a, a whole thing. lot of day drinking. Yeah. But when I do, I like it to be provided by someone else. Nice sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, I am actually quite familiar with the beer you're pouring here. And this one has been out, what, less than a year? Less than a year, so I really wanted to bring this one out. It's it's been doing well for us since we've released it. This is our juicy, uh, juicy IPA, um, and I still hear people say that I'm not an IPA drinker. I'm not an IPA. Yeah, drinker. I hear I hear that from time but to time, <laughs> like I, almost every guest we have on, and I'm like, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> yeah, so we've come out with uh, an IPA, this juicy IPA that is unlike what most people consider an IPA. Right. I mean. The American craft beer scene has, is great about evolving mm -hmm. um, existing styles. Sure. And in the last five years, there's the hazy IPA that has really dominated the market. And what, is, what it's been able to do for consumers is present what is hop flavor and aroma without the bitterness. Right, because so, the juicy qualities kind of help the bitter not be so strong on the back This has, end. like on the nose, too, there's a little bit of that hop dank that you get. Which I love. It's a, it's a good smell. Mm -hmm. I mean that in in a good way. But it it sets you up to expect a little bit of that resiny um, bitterness towards it, the end. Which of it. it doesn't really deliver on because of which the this citrus. one. Yeah, this one doesn't really come off. Like if we were to do Art Car side by side with this, right. this is really good. Mm -hmm. Art Car is much more bitter than than juicy. So as as somebody who's been a fan of all your beers for a while, and IPA being my favorite style. I was a huge fan of Alyssa for a while. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, though. I drank a lot of it, and I kind of burned out on Alyssa. And it wasn't too long after that that you guys released Art Car, and then that became my sort of go-to for, uh, for, for IPA. And then now my favorite of yours is, is in fact, this, this Juicy. But how does something like that, like the progression that I went through, how does that affect something like the sales of Alyssa, for example? Or has has Juicy cut into the sales of Art Car? Because I mean, Art Car is a monstrous here in Houston. I mean, there's it, it, Juicy has definitely not cannibalized Art Car. Art Car continues to grow, and that's always great. But see, it's, Art Car is, I think, designed to be much more approachable too, as a uh, in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as bitter as other IPAs on the yeah. market for sure. I mean, I think the the thing with St. Arnold Brewing is that we've always been focused on balanced and you don't want to be able to have a pint of some assaulting hoppy beer and then not want another of it because right. if if that's the case then you're never going to be a repeat buyer. And that's the true for, you know, any type of spirit or any type of, you know, food or even cigars or anything like that. It's like if it's you expend X amount of dollars on it and you have, you know, a fine experience with it, you're not going to buy it again then how are you going to stay in business? Right. 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 So with Alyssa, it's it's an old world IPA, and it has its it has its place amongst amongst our lineup. But Art Car is, it's become kind of this landmark IPA for us that it, it presents hop bitterness, but it also has a very nice clean finish, balanced, nice grapefruity vibe. Also, to it's it. substantially yep. lower ABV, right? The, well, it's Alyssa's, seven point one, and Alyssa's well, is seven point one to seven point five. I thought Art Car was less than that. And this one is less though, right? This is seven point one. Oh, it's man. the same as Art Car. That's wow. crazy because it feels and drinks lighter. Yeah, than Art and Car. and that's where we that's where we add the hops throughout the boiling throughout the boil process, and mm. so hops are added much later during the boil. So it extracts less bitterness. I've had this before, but it's been a while um, since I've had it. And I remember... It's been a while like for when me, I too. see it on I, the shelf... I want to say Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> when I see it on the shelf, I remember that I liked it, but I don't usually buy IPAs. Right, because you're and not the IPA. This, 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 this is the reason why I wanted to bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. This reminds me how much I like this beer. Right. It, it really Balance is. Balance in an IPA is a huge thing for me, and there's so many that are just... 
Oh, not. It, and and you're right. I drink a lot of IPAs. I try a lot of different IPAs, and they really fall into one of two categories, uh, uh, unless they're just not good. And most most of them that I have are good on on at least some level. But they fall into the that was interesting. I don't need category. it again. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> or they or they're like this where I go. Yeah, I I, I want to keep drinking this. I, w- I want to buy more of this. And and this really has become my go-to out of your entire lineup now because Excellent. I just think it's so well-balanced and enjoyable to drink. Now, um, did, does something like this, I'm guessing it happens almost more on the drawing board than it does in experimentation. Would that be, you're like, okay, we want something that's going to be a little less to bitter, a, a little more profile. citrusy. So we're going to do this to try and achieve it. Is that is that accurate? So we started experimenting with hazy IPAs with with a beer called Not a Collaboration, um, mm-hmm. where we experimented with a lot of late edition. And in, in did in you the release that? We did. I remember we had that on the show. I think we did. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it had the brash. It was it was not a collaboration with brash. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. And black can, right? Correct. Yep. And that was our first foray into creating a hazy beer. And we learned a lot from making that. And then we also did other releases at the beer garden under it, like a kind of a hazy kind of style. And we were, we were learning more and more, just like as you do with any process of, of, of experimenting. And once we decided that, okay, we're ready to release another IPA, we want to make more on that juicy kind of hazy spectrum so that we can f- fit that kind of pro- uh, flavor profile of having a bitter but balanced beer in art like Art Car, but also having more of a juicy kind of you know, fruit forward IPA, mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. that's kind of where Juicy felt. And we learned enough to where <clears throat> we we nailed down the test brews pretty quickly, and then and then we it came out with really it. Really seems to me like this is the sort of flavor and balance that IPAs have kind of moved to uh, through the whole hazy juicy experience uh, yeah. of the past what three four years. Yeah, and there's been some flack from from old school brewers of creating these hazy IPAs that. You know, the appearance of it, the ter- turbidity of it can be off-putting, but if it's bringing, what's so bad about bringing more consumers into experiencing a new style of beer? Right. And we're gaining, you're gaining more followers. And this is one that the, I love to be able to say to somebody when I get that, yeah, I'm not really an IPA guy. So, I can say, hey, try this. Yeah. You know? So in a, on the interesting side, you're talking about how traditional uh, old school brewers, you know, worry about the clarity and everything else. I think that uh, the clarity of a beer has... Has a place in your lagers and your uh, yeah. pilsners and things like that. But be, to be honest, like my brain, when you said that, immediately went to you know beers with more interesting texture visually have always been more interesting beers to me. So I tend to gravitate towards that. Just so you know, he likes beers that ha- that like, actually have stuff in them that you chew. Oh, you know, yeah. I don't mind if it's a little chunky. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. A little bit of <laughs> barrel sticking into it, you know, whatever, things floating. I it's think uh, we, we have, as a brewer, we have somewhat of a responsibility to ensure what you're consuming is, you know, safe and clean. <laughs> that's and, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows I, what I you were chewing in I brought a jail in one time that was a little oh uh, chunky God. in the bottom I, I, of it. I was like, it was he like. He hasn't let that one know, go. I, I, I like. You know, in most of my foods, I enjoy if they've got a little crunch or crispiness to them. <laughs> Think of it like beer but pulp. But in beverages, I don't know. So. Like, you get high pulp orange <laughs> juice, right? I mean, think of it like beer pulp. All right, we're going <laughs> to advance We're gonna advance into our uh, uh, our next beer here in just a moment. Plus, in our next segment, we want to try some of this. Um, I have no idea what it tastes like. No, I bet you don't. <laughs> uh, it's Espanita tequila. It is an Añejo, and we will be trying it next along with uh, whatever else. Else, uh, Aaron is going to pull out of his uh, surprise pack here. It's smoking and toasting. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is smoking and toasting. We are thrilled to be uh, bringing you show number two hundred and twenty-nine, halfway to three hundred. And our guest today is uh, Aaron Inkrot, the innovation manager from St. Arnold Brewery, who's brought along some wonderful brews. I do have, by the way, you may need a bottle opener for that. I do have, and you will be letting you take home your oh. own smoking and toasting. Uh, Brewers uh, should never leave home without yeah. a bottle opener. All right, very good. Uh, but first, <laughs> we're definitely. gonna first we're gonna go the tequila route, and Ian is 
standing by with, uh, wow, that sounded great, but it was almost as if that bottle had been opened before. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm appreciating the fact that the bottle you brought, you let it breathe. Yes, that's right. You, you don't, you don't want a that, lot. Uh, we don't want that neck, that neck pour. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so different from the rest of the bottle. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you guys agree. It's been. <laughs> Listen, I don't know if this is going to pour right. It doesn't have a, 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 what do you call it? A oh, a volcano swirl. The, the, the spiral uh, top. You yeah, know, that makes yeah. it pour smooth. Yeah. What did they call that? Uh, you remember when uh, Miller did that thing with Miller Light where they did? Oh the, yeah. The the Vortex. Vortex. The Vortex. The Vortex. Uh, vortex. Oh, yeah. That yeah. makes the which, beer. Which not only was just a sleazy, you know, meaningless you think, gimmick, it actually didn't work. I tried one. Do it you just poured straight out. St. Arnold could mm. reach a point at some time, at some time in their, um, in, in, in St. Arnold's career that, um, that you could just stop selling the beer and only work on packaging. <laughs> just, just sell yeah, like yeah. you know, just like sell whatever you know, beer. cold activated cans, vortex yeah. bottles, of the twelve pack that you can just put the ice yeah. into. I mean, look, I'm, <laughs> I'm holding up, I'm holding up a can. <laughs> These are real things. That's the best part. I'm holding up a can of H Town Pills right here from St. Arnold. And I have no indication from the color of this can there as to no whether way this of beer is cold. cold. How would I know if this Especially beer is Especially if cold? you're holding it. Can't, you're holding it. Because I think, but I think St. Arnold here <laughs> this makes is blue way more whether sense it's warm or cold. Logic right? You know yeah. why they always talking about like it's cold as the Rockies or it's like, yeah, right. well, the colder something is, the less you can actually taste it because it dulls, it dulls your taste buds. True. That's why that, that's why I call the cold activated can. I, I refer to it as an early warning system. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I were uh, awesome. my wife and I were staying at an Airbnb uh, oh. recently, <laughs> and uh, when I opened up the refrigerator. The last person who stayed there had left several cans of, of beer there, and one was a tall can of Coors Light. And That's I, why you had it. I, yeah, I immediately <laughs> texted a picture to Ian and said, "Can you tell if this beer is cold?" Yeah. Yeah. Coors. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that Ian and I both appreciate is that the worse a joke is, the more fun it is to tell repeatedly. Over. You know, well, it over, gets funnier over. the more times you tell it. It absolutely is. So I know really nothing about this company, Espanita. Well, they have this information a, on the bottle oh, here. Oh, what does it say? Es, Espanita Tequila. Tequila and Yeho. Honors uh, and Puro Agave. 18 months aged. And on the back, it says, according to the Surgeon General, women should not drink <laughs> okay, alcohol. good to know. This you know is, it says that on a this, lot of this is another one of those jokes that <laughs> ah. that p- appears to get funnier as it goes. All right. uh, expertly crafted. There's actually a lot on here. Um, I know it's 100 percent agave. That much I figured yes. out. Yes. <clears throat> um, but you don't want it if it's not. It has the N O M number and the C R T and everything that uh, Miss Liliana told us we should look for on here. You said 18 months in in barrels. In 18 months age. Speaking of Liliana, by the way, she piped up in the comments and says she loves the amber ale. Uh, from St. Arnold. Oh, great. And uh, says she has two each day with her lunch. Nice. I love Liliana. She's the best. She's going to be back on the show, by the way, uh, in just a few weeks when we do a uh, uh, an Añejo Tequila blind taste test. And I can't wait because she is our resident tequila yeah, this expert. This is aged for awesome. 18 months in bourbon barrels. Oh, okay. So, so that may explain some of the things that I think you're about most, to taste. Yeah, you? most Añejo tequilas are... Mm-hmm. Are all from ex bourbon barrels. Mm. It's where it gets the the you know the deeper flavors, the maple, the wood. The uh, this is yes, and there's a marshmallowy thing in the background. Yes, yes. and there's a the, like this is not what you'd expect in tequila. Now it has obvious tequila flavors. Like there's not like there's agave there. Yeah, it's not like you're going hmm. This doesn't taste like tequila, but it has some things that you do not expect at all. That's delicious. Tequila. It really is. I, I find it incredibly. And there's all, there's easy like to drink. no heat until right now. Yes. Like yes. I've been it's talking. A, it's I a sip super and delayed. Then I talk and it just came back and kind of hugged me a little. Super bit. delayed tequila that, hug is exactly yes. what it is. Is that 80, 80 proof? 90? Yeah, I, I believe it's 80. Yeah, that drink's real nice. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right at Marshmallows. 80 Whoever said marshmallow, I definitely get that. Yeah, on. it's yeah. definitely marshmallowy. And what was the other thing I got in there? Vanilla, obviously. There's some vanilla and maple. Yep. Mm hmm. Fluffy it, agave. It goes pepper. down so easily. There's also like an underlying cinnamon going on there, mm-hmm. too. It really is good. Um, about a. <laughs> You know, you have to do that when you say words. So, 
So this is about a thirty-five dollar bottle, which for añejo is really good. I want to point out that's that great. At thirty-five yeah. bucks. This gets like a six, right oh, off the bat. Six, right? Six. Absolutely, because better because my favorite. My favorite sort of go-to on Yeho tequilas are a little north of that. My absolute favorite's a hundred dollars north of that. So, yeah. um, so when you start talking about, you know, the Jose Cuervo uh, Reserva de la Familia, which is, which seems like it goes up like five bucks every time I go to the store. Yeah, you know? that that one's tough to beat. It really it's, is, that's, especially that's when it comes really to But delicious. that's just really good. So, so this is what I think is going to make this blind. Uh, Añejo taste test so interesting is when you've got them it's something we've never really done is side by side tequila tasting I've done flights but they've all been from the same you know tequila family so uh, so it I should love be this, interesting. this half sun and half moon with stars it's behind really, it on the really really interesting really cool. and there's so many new uh, tequilas out there as far as I know this one is not endorsed by an athlete actor or uh, <laughs> any other um uh, well known. It's figure. like a requirement. But I would have to. But I have to be almost, wrong. You'd yeah. almost have to hate it before we try it. If, yeah. if that was true. Well, I, I'm getting to the point where I can't even do that anymore because they they've got too many of them. You know, Heaven's Door is pretty awesome. Yeah, and uh, and the uh, Codigo tequila, yeah, the yeah. George Strega, yeah. the Long yeah. Ranch yeah. was just fine. Yeah, exactly. So it's getting it to the fine. point where. It's getting to the point where yeah, well, I and wouldn't that, say Long Branch was amazing and like and, way out there, and but it was fine. Wow, that that it was that Conor McGregor that Conor. Irish whiskey that was so good. <laughs> Not he sold that by the way. Did you hear that? Oh, I didn't. Know Who that. the hell bought that? I don't know. Somebody <laughs> bought. He made gazillions of dollars on it. Apparently. Ugh. Ah, uh, yeah. That's what I say when I try it. Ugh. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. But but you know, a lot of these things are. You know, I mean, look, if Nick Jonas has a a, a tequila, then everybody can have a tequila. That's the way I look at it. That's the way I look at it. So, well, this is this is great. <laughs> this is great. I, I as you can this tell, this is very good. Yeah. As you can tell, I've tried this before. But uh, yeah, this is really thirty five dollars. So I, I, I specs want or at, at want? specs. I believe it was between. I believe it was between thirty five and forty dollars. It was, uh, it was less than my sort of favorite go to in that price range, which is the Skelly. Mm. So it was a few dollars Skelly, less than that. If you haven't had that, oh man, uh, yeah, Skelly's very That's good. That's just yeah. such good stuff. So are this you a tequila a... guy? When it comes to spirits, n- not beer, where where do you uh, usually go? Ian's more of a whiskey guy. I'm more of a tequila rum guy. But I am in. Equal opportunist. I love um, that. <laughs> so, I'm a margaritas are. I would say whiskey is my preferred. But if you were to look at my my credit card report, uh, <laughs> margaritas and tequila are probably higher than whiskey. Interesting. Um, so, but my bar is pretty well stocked with with bourbon and scotch, as, as well as several different mezcals and and uh, tequila. Well. So, while you pour um, our next uh, beer, yeah, uh, let me go through this list uh, from the Rob Report, which, remember, it has to be pretentious to be in the Rob Report, because that's what they're all about. You know, this is the, and hard to get. And hard to get, yes. It's, although, um, maybe not as hard to get as some of the um, whiskeys that uh, Chris Hart has on his show. What's but, the uh, name of it again? Uh, it, the list... The 25 best bourbons of the 21st century so or far. Or bourbons that make you go. <laughs> exactly. Again, the high-tech sound effects. Um, yes. So I don't know that these are in any order, so we'll just go through it. E.H. Taylor, Jr., 18-year-old marriage. You want to buy it now, Ian? I've had E.H. Taylor. I don't think I've had that one. I don't think you have either because it's $2,888 a bottle. Oh, that's it? Yeah, that's all. Is that retail? Like, yeah, that's so retail So if you're going to get on the mark, black mm-hmm. market, it's going to be... It's going to be even more than that. On the second hand, it's going to be ridiculous. Now, at, If it's not ridiculous already. At this moment, I would like to uh, reach out to our good buddy, and hopefully he's uh, enjoying the show today, Nicholas Talamentes. Nick? I would very much like to taste this next bourbon. Uh, is this it's from Roses? Four Roses, and yeah. Nick Talamantes is, is our we got to get him back guy. on. Yeah, and tell we, him to we bring really whatever do. we're about. I, to I think that's about. I think that's in the works. By the nice. way, nice. So Nick, when you come, would you please bring some of the Four Roses Al Young 50th Anniversary Small Batch? It is um, named after Kentucky Distillers Association Hall of Famer Al Young. 
who worked at Four Roses for 50 years, and for his efforts, they named a whiskey after him. $1,951 is the retail price for this Four Roses whiskey. Mm. I'm used to paying like 40 bucks. Remember, for this is Roses, the Rob you know? Report. This is... Yeah, right. But this is what they do. This is why these are such outrageous lists to share. But Nick, I'm serious. If you can get your hands on some of that, we would be happy to do everyone a public service and taste it. Yes. Aaron's sure. coming to the studio, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Aaron will be here for that show. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to the list in a minute. Tell me what you've poured us and why it looks so wonderfully dark and delicious. So this is I Love You This Much. It's our commitment imperial stout with lots of raspberries. Um, we released this at the right in January when we launched our commitment. Mm -hmm. And we decided to have a fun little kind of spin on it by adding a bunch of raspberries to it. So kind of like going on that whole innovation thing was... Wow. We, we've made this beer a couple of years back, and when we were when it was in our fermenters, I was like, you know what? I really like chocolate covered cherries and raspberries. And raspberries. So I decided, raspberry and chocolate is just so one I for the ages. Threw in a bunch of raspberries to a small to a small fermenter, and this worked really well. And then the name comes from my daughter telling me when she was four or five years old, "Daddy, I love you this much," and she held her Aww. hands like this. Oh, see, that's awesome. And then and when. And then yeah. I brought it to the R&D meeting. I was like, this beer is called I Love You This Much. And everybody loved it. So, uh, there it was. so, so is, this a, is this something that is commercially available? It is. So we came. it's still, it's still available on some shelves. I was actually at the downtown specs, um, um, or midtown specs, depending on what you want to call it, uh, right off of Smith Street, and they still have some on the shelves. And, okay. Um, but we're going to be doing it every year. And there you so go. it'll be a yearly release? Yeah. <laughs> Always in, uh, in the larger bottles like this? Yep. A seasonal release, so we'll only only once a time or uh, during during uh, Valentine's Day. Mm. But so uh, I've had this before, and I thought the very same thing at the beginning of it that I thought this time is there's not a lot of nose to it. It smells no, like I noticed a stout. that. Yeah, right. It smells a little bit like a there's stout, but a it's not a not it a big all. nose. But it's bursting with flavor. But then you take a sip, and that dark. Uh, there's a tartness to the cherry flavor in there. It's so good. And with the bitterness of the way a stout finishes and that together, it just has this really, really awesome aftertaste. You guys have figured out how to do raspberry. We Because the raspberry AF is fantastic. And this just, wow. What I really like about this beer is it creates a very... Creating depth in a, in a beer is pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. um, like you can create as kind of a singular focus kind of flavor standpoint with with most beers, but creating a round beer with depth without <clears throat> being cloying or lingering on on the palate can can tend to be pretty difficult. And like you said, like the bitterness of the beer, but the tartness of of the raspberry, they play incredibly well. With, it, yeah, with, it feels with like this. the raspberry is tart and the chocolate is bitter. And yeah. bitter oh. chocolate's a wonderful thing. Oh so, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh. And there's a there's a sweetness to it, and I, I, sweetness is almost a strong word because it's there, but it's not real sweet. Mm -hmm. It's not as sweet as you'd even expect most stouts to be. Right. Um, and there's kind of a underlying coffiness to it as well that's really nice that has mm -hmm. a little acidity to it that like roast roasty acidity. Yeah, to it. yeah, yeah. Like a, yeah. It's. It's a very complex and interesting beer too. It's I have just, had this before. It's quite yeah, good. Yeah, uh, that's, that's. You can good. still get this on tap at the brewery, actually. Yeah, me and my wife split a bottle of that a couple weeks back. Oh, nice, nice, and 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 very romantic because you're yeah. like, honey, I'm opening up the I love you this much. Let's. Yeah, it was funny as I was picking out beers, uh, and by picking out beers, I mean uh, grabbing um, the Springbok. Because I've been trying to drink you guys out of it, and my wife came around the corner with a bottle of this, and I was like, "Throw it in there, let's yeah. do it." Yeah, that's great. I mean, that really, it is a wonderful bottle to share. And it's a what what I love about beers like this is whether you get it now or back when it was released, and or a year from now, it's these beers age very, very well. Yeah, and mm, good it's high it's high alcohol. I believe it's twelve something, twelve point eight percent alcohol. Mm, it might be. I should probably pick up a couple. If that's you're right. going to do this every year. I might right be in your neighborhood, saving yeah. them for three or four. So you and say doing in, a vertical. in Houston, these are still at the uh, Midtown was, Specs, right? I was just at Midtown, and they probably pulled it from other markets. Those are about markets. ten dollars a piece, if I remember. I got it. I think it was right around nine ninety nine or yeah, ten, yeah. ten something mm -hmm. like that. But yeah, totally worth it. By the way, Bruce uh, Stark, one of our regular uh, listeners, um, who is up in uh, Michigan, 
um, chimed in wanting to know about the availability of St. Arnold outside of Texas. Is it true? Is it still true that you guys are only available in the state? Texas and Louisiana, and that's it. Any thoughts of going wider? I mean, this is you're the you're the oldest craft brewery in Texas. You're the biggest one by volume. The only one that made the top fifty list. Think, uh, I don't know. I, well, I, I hate always thinking here, that bigger is better. Here's but. the thing: we seventy five percent of our volume is sold in the city of Houston, and and our home market is still growing. Mm. So, if we have an ability to grow within our own home market. There is not only an interest in ours to do that, but also there's a certain business aspect of rather than sending it out to further into markets, there's also a cost associated with that. Sure, of course. It's got to so, be more expensive to, to go yeah, but uh, outside of that. We, we always love the idea of venturing out, but if there's a demand within arm's reach, we, it's, in my opinion, our responsibility to fulfill that demand first. Okay. And, uh, that makes sense. Plus, then people in Saskatchewan get to trade for uh, St. Arnold. Beer. That's right. That's right. What do they have in Saskatchewan that we want? Because we'll send you some art car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. We will. We're back to the beer trading market. Uh, in the uh, the next uh, bourbon on this list is a little more affordable. It's the Old Forester 150th anniversary bourbon. Which batch? Um, there were three batches. Just says, uh, you know, it, they don't. Batch one of three is 125.6 proof. Uh, batch two of three weighs in at 126.4. And batch three, 126.8. They're basically saying all three batches. Have you tried more than one batch of this? I've tried all three. I've got batch three at the house now. And uh, what you're thinking on I'm its a, quality? I'm a. S- I'm a slut for Old Forester. Okay. Old Forester. I've got the bottled and bond at the house right now. The, well, this, their birthday bourbon is probably by far and away my favorite. Because Awesome. It yeah, it's incredible. Well, um this is a two hundred and fifty dollar bottle is what they say it retails for. Mm, not true. Okay. Did no. you pay more? No, I paid less. You well, paid less? I, I was able to get it. I was able to get it for retail, which was $125. So most likely the Rob but, Report got it for $125, too. They were just too <clears> embarrassed <throat> to admit that it, was, uh, yeah. it wasn't Not everybody can so. get the bottle. I mean, yeah. it was, yeah. we, it was a, it's a Specs Preferred pick, and right, right. they let you know if you can pick it up. So next we want to give a big shout-out to our girl Jessica because Barrel Bourbon Batch 009 is on oh, nice. the Rob Report nice. list. Uh, they don't give a price for this, but I'm sure we can uh, we can find out from her. Uh, but it is their Barrel Bourbon Batch 009, and it was released in 2016, and it can be most easily acquired now on the secondary market, as the article says. So um, I, I'm just... I'm just a big fan of their products. Did they say these are the best bourbons of 2021? They're saying, yes, the best bourbons of the 20th, but that was 21st. They're saying, of the, they're saying of the 21st century. Oh, 21st century. Yeah, so far. So the next one, <laughs> Angel's Envy Cast Strength, finished in port barrels. Nice. Mm-hmm. And uh, She's uh, expensive. $343 is the price they list on here. So That's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm still loving that. Angel's Envy Rye that you gave me yeah, for yeah. Christmas, man. That, that is a bourbon. Yeah. My, so, my uh, my brother in law told me about this, his the best man at Manhattan he ever had, and they used that cask rye, with Kochi, uh, sweet vermouth, and it is nice. It's dessert. Nice. Nice. It, it, it's a wonderful spirit. It's just, it's, it's just so everything good. about it is just wonderful and exciting. Uh, Rabbit Hole Darren Darringer. D a r e, r i n g e r, dare ringer, or is it Derringer? Rabbit hole Derringer. I've never seen this uh, particular uh, straight bourbon whiskey, but uh, it is finished in sherry casks and it's ninety four dollars. I don't think I've, I've ever, ever tried a rabbit hole. I've rabbit seen hole, them advertised, yeah. but I haven't. I haven't, I haven't tried any other. Russell's Reserve, nineteen ninety eight. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a two thousand dollar bottle according yeah. to this. Yeah. Have you had any of that? No. No. Yeah, neither have I. <laughs> That's out of my league. Uh, High Wire New Southern Revival Straight Bourbon Made with Jimmy Red Corn. And uh, I don't care. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Uh, uh, Jimmy Red is a moonshiner's corn uh, that had all but become extinct until a South Carolina farmer brought it back to life in the early aughts. By 2016, the folks at High Wire Distilling in Charleston 
um, who felt that many of the big boys in the industry weren't paying enough attention to it. Um, they used Jimmy Red to make truly unique bourbon. One hundred and nine dollars ceramic uh, moonshine bottle too. Yeah, which is kind of cool. Nice, kind of cool. Uh, this one I have had, and it just makes me happy. Little book, chapter four, oh. lessons honored. Yes. The yeah, the rice. What was the rice that they used in that? Uh, it. Let me see if it says here because I don't remember. It's like a type of black rice or um, something like that. Uh, it's an eight-year-old high rye. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just absolutely wonderful, and I'll tell you, really, any of the little books. Yeah, that's are, my favorite little book so far. It really is the number four, huh? Chapter four. That was real good. Very cool. High West American Prairie Bourbon. Uh, by the way, the little book is one hundred and seventy-five dollars retail price. For thirty-nine dollars, though, you can pick up a High West American Prairie Bourbon. This is the Rob Report. It's a rubber port trying to act like they're not all that, you know, all the time. Uh, High West American Prairie, they say a blend of straight bourbons aged from 2 to 13 years, rich and earthy on the palate. Um, High West donates 10% of the profits from the sale of each bottle to the American Prairie Reserve, which is dedicated to protecting and preserving America's natural resources. $39. Knob Creek Limited Edition 2001, uh, which is $140. Double Eagle, very rare bourbon. That's uh, why you're laughing. Is that is that a not an accurate price? Well, no, 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 no. I, I double, I eagle? double Eagle. Yeah, like, d- that's that's unattainable or yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. it well, <laughs> you can't find I, I you think, can't find Eagle Rare at all. I think, well, I know. That, yeah, but like, no, I think Double Rare, Double uh, Eagle Rare. I mean, I think you could get it. It you it, it only set you back fourteen thousand dollars. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess I can trade in my truck. By now, it says fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, that's got to be secondary. That's, uh, my yeah. God. Here's one called Mike Drop or Mike Dot Drop Dot. Uh, I feel and like I've it seen is that before. A blend of twenty different casts of eight-year-old whiskey, eighty-five dollars, and John E. Fitzgerald Very Special Reserve twenty-year-old, which comes in a very nice wooden box at 1800 and finally Woodford Reserve Masters Collection 2009 seasoned oak finish at 900 oh i thought that was the last one there's also Jefferson's Twin Oak Custom Barrel from Jefferson's Reserve and that one is $88 so Jefferson's there you go. pretty solid overall yeah. Yeah, overall. And uh, in keeping with uh, what usually happens pretty much anywhere I go, someone is running a leaf blower, and uh, I can I can hear it. It doesn't matter where I am. There will be a leaf blower We are three stories up from yeah. that right oh, I now. Know. I know. It, it it's, sounds... a, it's a leaf blower. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, you can be in the middle of the concrete jungle, and a leaf blower will appear. It's amazing how ubiquitous they have become. All right. We got to take a break. We'll be back drinking news in our next segment, and we have more St. Arnold to try. See another tall box. Bottle peeking its uh, neck out there. Uh, very excited. And by the way, I absolutely love the I love you this much. Fantastic. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is Smoking and Toasting. It is show number 229. We're all about craft beer, fine spirits, and, um, oh, yeah, hand rolled cigars. And we're brought to you by MyCigarShirts.com. Great shirts on the web for cigar lovers. MyCigarShirts.com because... Cigars. Support them, please, because they support us. Um, We learned during the break, or Ian learned and shared with us, that apparently... Uh, the uh, I I Liliana uh, put this up. Oh, Liliana gave us that information. See, she's she is our resident tequila expert, so of course she would be the one to come forward with the information. This Espanita tequila that we've been loving is apparently either owned or endorsed by Pitbull, Mister Worldwide. <laughs> oh, I liked it so much better before I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will tell you, when the Final Four was here in Houston, I, I live in a building downtown across from the uh, uh, from Discovery Green, from the park, which is right in front of the convention center. And um, I was able to sit out on my balcony and watch all the music performances because they set up the stage facing my way, and they had these huge video screens on the sides of the stage. So even though the, the people were actually small, the video screens were... Very viewable. So I got to see, you know, 21 Pilots and, you know, a handful of, of, of interesting artists. And one of the artists was uh, Kendrick Lamar, who was great. One of the artists was Pitbull. And I have to say, I really enjoyed watching him. 
I'm still not sure what he does, but it was fun. You know? He said his name a lot. He said Mr. Worldwide. And, you know, the music was pumping. And there were dancers. You know? It was kind of like watching, uh, I don't know, a, a, a dance show, I guess. But uh, anyway, he looked he looked quite dapper. Welcome to music. Yeah, music <laughs> 2021, right? Um, so uh, welcome to music for one of our favorite segments on the show. It's time now, my friends, for Drinking, drinking News. Drinking News, Drinking News. Now it's time for Drinking News. Florida man with one arm said he had a gator for a pet. When I asked about his absent arm, he said, uh... I had to take my gator to the vet. Drinking news, drinking news. Now it's time for drinking news. Cheers, y'all. Uh, thank you and welcome to Drinking News. It is the segment of the show where we pass along a story that we at least believe, based on the best research we could possibly do, to actually be true. And it is not always a story about drinking, although sometimes it is, but it is always a story that you will probably enjoy most if you've been drinking, which we have. We've had Pitbull's tequila, and we've had Amazing St. Arnold, and there's more to come. So uh, here we go. <clears throat> a Florida man. See, I'm getting used to waiting for the little uh, musical note whenever I say a Florida man. Does this need to be underscored? Perhaps, yes. Okay. A Florida man who runs a gas station in Jacksonville had to post an unusual sign on the appliance that's in his store next to the prepackaged sandwiches and those hot dogs that rotate, you know, round and round on that little hot dog rotation thing. Is there a name for that? It's not a grill. What do you call yeah, it? It's not a rotisserie. Hot dog cooker thingy? You're round and round turning spinning yeah, hot dog thingy. Well. Yeah. Wait, uh, is it the one where the it sits between the two rollers? Yeah, yeah. A hot dog roller? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Bruce on Stark, if you know, help us out with the name of that device. I call it hot dog roller thingy. Anyway. Have you ever eaten a hot dog off one of those? I have. And I'm not embarrassed to admit Who it. Who hasn't? <laughs> but the secret to the hot dog roller, never take the one closest to you. Because it's been on there for no. days. Always reach back. The gray hot dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Parul Patel is the owner of the BP Gas and Convenience Store in Jacksonville. Says he's become sick and tired of people, locals, using his microwave to warm their urine. You can post that what? picture now, Adam. You may want to look at the picture there, Ian. Uh, yep, apparently those coming into the station to use the microwave were allegedly not customers, but instead were suspected to have been en route to a nearby drug testing facility. Indeed, a LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics are both within walking distance of this particular BP gas station. And although a spokesperson for Quest Diagnostics alleges their facility doesn't do drug testing there, LabCorp has apparently remained silent on the matter. Patel, the owner of the store, believes that these people are desperate to pass their drug tests and are using the microwave as a way to warm the urine so it would appear as if it had just come out of a human body and wasn't a prepackaged clean sample. Um, Regardless, he says, uh, they walk in off the street, microwave urine containers, then leave. He said they often become violent or aggressive when asked not to do so. He described one such incident in which the culprit was so desperate to microwave her urine that she started cussing and replied, well, where is the sign that says you can't use this for this purpose? Oh, and so no. the Florida man created a warning sign that has since gone viral. And you can see on I the have to tell you something. Here. Those yeah. are real if people. I, if I... <laughs> So there's a couple things about this. If we just start to unpackage this a little bit, okay? <laughs> Are you sure that we should? <laughs> the first thing is, if I walked into a store and it had that sign on there, you can guarantee I'm not using the microwave. Yes. Like, I'm just not even going to touch it, yeah, right? Yeah, no. The I'll second, have a cold sandwich. Thank the you. The second thing is WTF. Yes. Like, okay, I'm just, I'm not even going to unpackage the rest of that. This is Whether the sign's working or not remains to be seen. But I think we can determine the fact that you have to have that conversation. <laughs> I, I 
I don't even know what to say about that. These like, are the times we live in, my people. brother. These like, this the, is people. Yep. This is people. These are the times we live Can in. Can you ever imagine having to put that sign on a microwave? <laughs> well, I mean, that's why they have the warning signs that you always find ridiculous, <laughs> because... Yeah. People have actually done that. Yeah. Like the ladder I bought that had a sign on it that says, do not step. Silica gel, do yeah. not eat. Yeah. Yes. Who looks at it and goes, hmm. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> apparently, every, someone yeah. did, or we wouldn't have that Every warning, warning right? sign you, you have the, ever seen in your life. Do you remember the Tide Pod Challenge <laughs> BS? Oh, yeah. When people they, did that. And they were trying to tell people, well, they make it look like candy. You know what? Everything in nature that is brightly colored will hurt you or kill you right right everything in nature that is brightly colored <laughs> that should be a natural like mm -hmm. uh, yeah well real people these are real people <laughs> that's a real story and that drinking news is your drinking news. drinking news that was ridiculous time for drinking news drinking news yeah drinking news that was time for drinking news oh, cheers y'all <laughs> See, I told you that story. That's a perfect example. That story is better heard when you're drinking. <laughs> right. and, and, and I'm empty. So let's, uh, let's do some more of this uh, day drinking. You know, we should. Smoking and Toasting is a great name for the show, but we could have just called it day drinking. Yeah. Yeah? Because it works. Oh, nice. Nice. This is something you could only get at the garden. Oh. But it no longer exists. Other oh. than in my cellar. So we're in Chris Hart territory now. Yes. Yes. I know of him. I've never met him. Chris Hart's a, uh, a friend of the show, and we love him dearly. And he has his own show. It's actually a very good show called Whiskey Neat. We yeah. encourage you to check it out. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's it's a show where Chris sits and talks to people of all walks of life about all kinds of things. And they drink uh, whiskey that's really good and that you can't buy anywhere. You can't ever get it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's almost like a nanny nanny boo boo type of thing, you know? So, all right, this looks as dark and delicious as the last one. Maybe maybe not quite as uh, viscous, but, so uh, but this dark is and delicious all the same. Another stout. Um, however, we do what we call a double barrel yeah. aging. Mm. We aged for 17 Ooh, months this smells good. Mm -hmm. in a bourbon barrel. Then we took it out of said bourbon barrel, and we put it into another bourbon barrel. Mm. And You know what's better than a months. bourbon barrel? What? Two Another bourbon, bourbon barrel. Barrels. Yeah, <laughs> that works for me. And I got to tell you, whereas the I love you this much, which had explosions of flavor when you drank it, but had not much on the nose. This just, one lights up the nose. Yeah, yeah, this one is huge on the nose. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, this one is huge on the palate. <clears throat> this reminds me of. So I'm a big baker at home. I love baking pies and Ooh. kind of like kind of sweet. Ooh. This reminds me of a just a big bourbon brownie baker's chocolate like just big on that explosion front so when you guys are making a uh, a beer like this how do you source your bourbon barrels do you buy them online do you hook up with a uh, particular distillery that you know what's the best way so there's there's a variety of ways that we go about by acquiring used barrels um you can either go the route of trying to source it directly from a distillery or a winery um, or you can go kind of the secondhand uh, market, which is kind of like on some occasions can be dealing with a used car salesman. Or <laughs> sometimes it's a. I like, thought you were going to say like the barrel mafia is what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> like, sometimes it's like you just get a rotten egg. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and, but sometimes that's just based off of the care of that wood barrel that it got even before the, the uh, barrel broker had. But yeah, I've got <clears throat> lots of. Lots of friends within the, the the barrel industry that have either that either work directly for a winery or distillery or that work for a broker. And not to, I'm not trying to give a bad name to brokers because there are several good ones Some out there, reputable ones. Sure, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we we tend to we tend to buy from uh, in the broker category from from two different ones in the industry, either uh, Rocky Mountain Barrel Company or, or Kentucky Barrel uh, Kentucky Bourbon Barrel, and they source them directly from, dis from the reputable distilleries, distilleries yeah. and. Yeah. We know that when they were emptied, when they were put on a truck and shipped to us, because the big focus that I want when we're buying bourbon barrels is, are they, are they wet? Right. Are they? Do you know where your barrel has been? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. No, seriously. But because if it's dry, it doesn't do you any good, right? Well, if it's dry, it's going to require my team to to swell the barrel to like you know kind of refresh the wood stave oh. so that they're that 
as soon as we get it. We don't want to put beer in, and it's just starting to leak everywhere. Yeah. Right. Um, we want to make sure that as soon as we fill it, that there's going to be as minimal leakage as what possible. What do you use to swell? Do you use steam or what? we? I mean, we we use uh, we use hot water. Um, so you can use you can upright the barrel so that it's on head on head, and then you can fill a little bit of hot water on top of the head, and that helps swell the head and the and the outer rings. <clears throat> because if you fill the barrel itself with hot water, you're going to remove a lot of yeah yeah wood not only wood character say, but a also a lot of the original and, yeah so. My big focus is we've made it. We've we've got a good reputation with with a couple of brokers that, hey, when are you emptying X distilleries barrels, and can you get it to us in about a I week mean, or two? You do live in Houston, so you could just swallow barrels by opening the door and letting them <laughs> sit for a little bit. Right? During yeah. the summer, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But there's um, definitely occasions where, I mean, I ask them like, yeah, we they just emptied them last week, and they'll be at your front door and. A couple days. But if there's a little juice still like sloshing around on the bottom, that's kind of a bonus, isn't it? I can confirm nor deny that we have had that happen for us. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Noted. So um, I've always wondered about this. Maybe you can clarify this for me. You you hear and see the phrase Russian Imperial Stout. Obviously, that's a style of yes. stout. Yeah. What is it about a particular stout that makes it? The style of a Russian style. You can tell by its accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in, <laughs> we need to see a papist. Oh no, that wasn't Russian. Sorry, that was something else. There Forget are it. there are three countries that are primarily responsible for a majority of the beer styles that are regarded as the under BJCP, which is the Beer Judging Certification Program. Um, so those are Belgian, German, and, and English. So Russian Imperial Stout is an English beer uh, because it was used to transport beer over to Russia to Kate. Catherine the Great, and, okay. her, and her favorite one was these big, dark beers, and that's eventually what became the Russian Imperial Stout. Related question, what is the difference between a pale ale and an India pale ale, or an IPA? Is it the same? So English was responsible for pale ales and India pale ales. Mm -hmm. um, India pale ales came into predominance in the late 1700s when they were settling in India, and they would transport beer. And required hops are a beautiful um, kind preservative, of pre right? preservative yeah. for for beer. So they would essentially add more hops to sur survive the travel down to India, mm -hmm. and hence the India Pale there, Ale. There's an irony though, because when you buy an IPA, you're supposed to drink it fresh. Right. I mean, this is back in the 1700s, so it's like freshness wasn't necessarily. I mean, the beers that you can sing, which is yeah, beer. not yeah. spoiled, is good enough. But also, yeah. they didn't have they didn't have uh, sanit sanitizing capabilities and that we currently do, and, and mm -hmm. so a lot of the beer that you were you were likely drinking back then had a fair amount of acidity to it. Right. Um, but the hops help preserve any micro microbiolo right, right. microbiological growth, and uh, which would help curb that acidity. See, I'll tell you the um, the whole idea of IPAs, India Pale Ale, being British. I find so interesting because as a cuisine, their food is incredibly bland, and yet they came out <laughs> with the beer that was probably at that time the most flavorful style you can get. Still may be, depending on what you like, but like but, it, it just stands in such contrast. I mean, yeah. if you've ever eaten a shepherd's pie, I mean, it's good and all, but it's not a it's kind of singular focus. Yeah, right, right, exactly. But um, then, you, then the American Pale Ale came out, um, the have to pay homage to Sierra Nevada back in mm -hmm. 1980, oh, yeah. and that was the big ho and focus that, on. By the way, that's still a great beer too. Yeah, 1980. It, it's it actually brought hops as a focal point of hey, there is flavor and aroma with hops, mm -hmm. and then the American brewing scene just took it over and actually explored what hops could actually be. Whereas you look at other countries, hops were purely used for the actual focus of what they were Of what they were plant. designed to do in the... Yeah, right, as a preservative. There are and a few that people is on the West Coast that found the outside limits of hops. Yes, I believe. yeah, I believe so. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But I will say, the, I mean, to me, the hops are wonderful, magical, and mystical. I feel about hops the way many of my friends feel about the hemp plant. About, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's they're just, they're, they're just a wonderful... A wonderful thing that nature's given us, you know? It's wonderful. It's it's great. 
I, I want to wear like shirts made out of hops and stuff, like they do with <laughs> like they do with him. You know, you might get a rash. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Lots of but oil. I, but I'd still enjoy it. But yeah. it'll smell delicious. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so when you guys make, you, you said this one's no longer available. How much of that was made when you uh, when you first put it out? We, uh, I believe, we had about. I don't know, 100, 100 cases. So 120 bottles, basically, is all we had of that wow. beer. Um, and we do, I mean, we try to do unique offerings at the beer garden to kind of create excitement and show offerings that we can do. And can we do this, like, statewide for releases? We could, but the cost of it would right, be... Rolling something like this out statewide is, is bigger. And no but... one's going to want to spend... What I'm, I'll, I'll say thirty, forty dollars right. for a bot for a, a single five hundred milliliter bottle. No one's going to want it. There's ve- the market for that is very small. Sure. But we can charge a smaller amount if we just release it at the garden. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the garden. We are in what we hope to be the beginning phase of things. The final stages. Beginning to go back to normal. The final stages of of dealing uh, with with COVID. Certainly, I don't want to imply that it. The danger's over. It's not. But that said, places are beginning to open up. Um, death rates are beginning to go down. More and more people are beginning to be vaccinated. How have you guys handled all of this during this year-long-plus pandemic? And what do you see as kind of your next steps as things return? Uh, can I come back to the beer garden and try something like this again? Yeah, we we do have... Uh, still one-off beers that you can still get at the beer garden. Um, as of now, we're we're only operating at 50% capacity outside. We have yet to open the indoor uh, restaurant. Um, the main reason why that is is because we're actually using it as a staging area for beer to go. A lot of people buying beer at the garden to take home. So I've been through the line a couple times, and you just drive up, and you tell them what they want, and they bring it out to you. It's a beautiful wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And they are it's, fast and yeah. efficient. It's yeah, we've we definitely learned some lessons, but yeah, we're pretty efficient now for anybody that you can call in or you can go to our website and schedule a time to pick up. Um, but you can still come to the restaurant. Um, we we're open outside. Um, we're actually working on doing some renovation inside. Um, I've I've heard a couple dates of what we're hoping to open the inside. I don't want to relay that online quite yet, but um we're hoping sometime in the summer that we will open inside. Um, but uh, we're, we actually open the kind of the game area of the beer garden on the weekends. Uh, and then we have kind of like a beer can um, stay, uh, uh, stand where you can come and buy cans of our beer rather than having to wait in the line at the uh, – um, in the rest uh, on the, the beer garden area. That's a long way from doing everything in the parking lot in the front when you guys first moved yeah, over. There. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. It's, it's come a long way. You're right. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with our final segment on the show. But I just have to say this: this double barrel Russian Imperial Stout. Will you make this again at some point? Please do. I'm it's sure delicious. we will. Yeah, because it's delicious. It really is. <laughs> it's so complex and interesting. And there's so many flavors, like dancing on your palate after you uh, take a sip of this. And it's just, uh, wow, we've tried some really amazing things here today. That's, I wanted to bring, because you guys are, I think this is a great cigar beer, too. I oh, bet yeah. that is. Wow, that would be good, yes. I, I think that would go with just about anything. Like, even a, I've been even all a about that cigar. CAO Bones recently. Oh, yeah? That would go amazing with this. That would go this. great with this, yeah. I would crank up an A.J. Fernandez Bella Artez with this. It would be wonderful because mm-hmm. it's got such great chocolatey notes to it that would just marry so nicely with this. Uh, they would, as you like to say, Ian, form like Voltron. Yes. Yeah, I have a feeling. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a uh, break. We'll be back to close out the show. It's Smoking and Toasting. Thank you guys for being here. Sounds of the uh, band from Suffers. Houston, Texas, The Suffers, who are so good. Oh, man. I can't wait. I I think the thing I'm most excited for, Ian, is getting back out to see live music again. Yeah. I'm so missing it. I'm so missing it. I'm going to have to make that decision if I want to go out and play live music again. Well, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. What about, um, uh, like, even, even just small clubs with a guy and a guitar on the stage you know what i mean speaking like, of which uh i talked to um uh, uh i'm just 
<laughs> totally blank. He, he does our. Oh, uh, I thought I thought you were reading comments. No, so. he does our. Uh, well, no, I, I got distracted because Liliana was wondering if she could still uh, redeem the six pack holders for points. Oh, do you still do that? The six pack that's holders while, for points. Huh? I think it's been a while. Yeah, I have no idea, but I'm going to say yes. Okay. So, no, sound, what I started to say is I uh, I chatted with uh, John Egan the other day. Ah, uh, John Egan, who by the way. Performs the smoking and toasting theme song that yes, you hear at the yes. beginning of the show. He's so good. I'm, I'm He's working. I'm reshaping a guitar neck for him at the oh, moment. Oh, nice. So he came by to see if he was liking the shape on it. But um, yeah, he said like the Big Easy is still not open. There's a bunch of clubs, but he's been playing a few nights a week out, so it's it's starting to open up a bit. I've been to the Mucky Duck. I got got to see a. a he's been yeah. He's been up the, the Mucky, Mucky Duck, Duck yeah. event. But yeah, it's, it'll be it'll be good though. I think I think it's I think it's around that the guy's corner. Great. Have you seen him play? He's played our anniversary party oh, a few man, times, he and so he good. he's very talented. He often plays uh, at the market bar, which is downstairs in my building, and my wife and I always go down and have a couple of beers and and you know put money in his tip jar because it's just as authentic as it gets. I have to laugh. You know, he has this little stomp board the that stomp he uses, box, right? Yes, or whatever it is. yes. Yeah. And uh, it cracks me up because I had totally forgotten about this until I was talking to him a few years back. Um, come to find out, I sold him that. <laughs> I was when you working, were working at Rock and Robin? No, I was working at a place called Sand Mountain Music, and we went to the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth Guitar Show one year. And the booth behind us, and I'll tell you, you don't want the booth next to this place because <laughs> you hear all day long, thum, thum, thum. Yeah, <laughs> and some people don't have that good a rhythm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, so I was looking at these stomp boards. I was like, "This is a really cool thing." And me and the uh, the guy that owns Sand Mountain Music like, kind of talked about it. And we picked up a few, and then I, John was a guy that used to come to the shop all the time, and he ended up buying one from me. And I had totally forgotten about that. And we were talking about his stomp board. He's like, "Yeah, I bought that from you." I was like, "Holy crap!" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's a small world. That yeah, was like back that in is. the '90s, you know. But I wouldn't want to paint it. Um, so uh, let me just ask a question about your lineup of beers. Um, you seem to have shifted philosophy a little over the last year or so, uh, because St. Arnold, I, I, I would have thought from the past, you know, more about this really strong core line, occasional things like the Divine Reserve or the Bishop's Barrel. Uh, but now it kind of feels like you're introducing more new things more often. Is that am I? Am oh, I? You're not am wrong. I on it? Yeah, you're so, not wrong. So yeah. what is that? Just because of what you're seeing as shifting? Yeah, because your your traditional core trends? line was the amber, and the brown, the amber, and then the you brown, turned that it was the, the brown turned into the ale wagger, right? And then yeah. uh, the Alyssa, uh, the Alyssa, and um, that's what I can think of right now. Well, I remember the uh, uh, lawnmower, lawnmower, right, yeah. Right. Lawn more, and then you had some offshoots like Weed Whacker and a few others. We'd always have our seasonal line too. Right. Yeah, summer pills and Christmas. I ale. love the seasonals. Like, mm -hmm. like I think your core lines. And great, you're still doing the, the seasonals. seasonals. We are, but it feels like there's a new St. Arnold beer more often now. Is that right? Absolutely, and, um, and by design. That is by design. Yeah, and it's it's essentially where that's the consumer demanding that kind of because people really want to know what's new these days they, they want yeah. something new all the time and it's, like i mentioned at the very beginning was like <clears throat> consumers are schizophrenic yeah they, you have no idea what they're going to want from one day to the next so and what's the best way for you to predict that since you're the innovation manager what do you what do you watch to try to give you a feel for where consumers are going next well i don't think anybody predicted uh, the hard seltzer phenomenon um but I, I predicted it wouldn't last, so I was wrong about that. You know? <laughs> I mean, it is, it's as big as light can gear. You, and you guys have got somebody, a hard seltzer we do. now, right? We just yeah. launched can it. somebody make a hard seltzer that doesn't taste like that? Aspartame? Fake sugar, yeah, so should try ours. So you really the should try the, the St. Arnold because it does super not fine. have St. Arnold Superfine, you should try that. We All don't right. use any, we use 100% real fruit. There's no chemical extract flavoring whatsoever, and there's no back sweetening. Yeah, because some of them taste okay until the aftertaste hits. And I'm like, oh, no, nope, never yeah. going to do that Some of again. them taste okay, and then all of a sudden you've had eczema. We did our uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we did our blind taste test on those uh, yes. a few weeks back, and, and I figured out that I really, really like beer. <laughs> yeah, but it but it is a phenomena though the hard seltzer thing it's a phenomena. But it yeah it really is we've I mean I see the we get to see the kind of IRI data of, of how 
what brands and what uh, flavors are, are predominantly being sold. And it's incredible what hard seltzer has, has become. It's, mm -hmm. it is truly not, not to be a, not to be a pun, but it has become just as big as, uh, as light beer almost. Wow. And, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean that's crazy, but yes, it it really, it really has. I like how so, he put light beer and truly in the same sentence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anything you can tell us about what's next? Sure. Um, so we have we're always releasing something unique at the beer garden. Um, we try to do it at least once is, a month. Is that available as a newsletter, or is that something you guys send out, or do you just have to check the website for that? Yeah, we we have. Um, we release our news, newsletter at least uh, a couple times a month, depending on what's being released. Um, we just announced today uh, that we're coming out with a new Russian Imperial Stout, the same base beer as this double barrel um, that aged in bourbon barrels with cocoa nibs, coffee, and vanilla bean. Oh, nice. That um, sounds good. That'll mm -hmm. be available in stores on Monday. Um, you can pre-order tomorrow and actually pick it up at the beer garden um, as well. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of things cooking. Um, I, I can tell you that we're in R and D. We 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 tried something that uses the boiler room base that that we hope we could launch, um, creating a new offering with that. Um, yeah, we're and then we we hope to have kind of a, a new pale ale um, on the hazier side come the fall as well. Fun. So it's kind of playing off that juicy spectrum yeah. um, where it's not as bitter bitterness forward but more of that kind of citrus tropical fruit forward where you get hop flavor not not bitterness um but in the pale ale abv so more of in like like the six percent range rather than seven percent range well i have to say it, you guys make us proud to be from here because we can all we have you know when people start talking about you, you know you run into somebody from portland oregon and they start going off about their oh, their uh sure you know their breweries i'm like well let me tell you something yeah we're, we're not too shabby down here uh and and it's it's really a, a a very cool thing for us to we almost feel like you know as somebody who's has waited in line for divine Stop. reserve speaking you know, of which i got some uh bishop's barrels and some divine reserves that we need to go ahead and start drinking yes i think we do yeah do it i think the time to uh they're, they're starting to the get... time to save those is past my friend Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Aaron, thank you so much for being on the show today. This it was, was a blast. great fun. The beer was tremendous. And uh, uh, we found out you're a bourbon aficionado, too. So that's a, uh, that's a, yeah, we'll have, we'll definitely have to have you back if we can get Nicholas to bring uh, some of that uh, $1,800 a bottle oh, yeah. of Four Roses <laughs> onto the show. And by the way, just to point back earlier in the show, Hot Dog Roller uh, yes. is the best thing that they could come the up with. The best thing. Okay. And Bruce well, I need to get one to put next to my Jaeger machine right underneath my disco ball. It's going to be an amazing. <laughs> awesome. Chill. I'm so coming over to your house. <laughs> uh, to our uh, buddy Bruce Stark up in uh, up in uh, Long Michigan. Stark. Uh, Bruce, find us some good Michigan beer that we can't get here, and we'll trade you some St. Arnold. I'll make you a nice little care package. We'll uh, uh, we'll swap them back and forth. Beer beer swaps are fun. By the way, if you tell the post office it's books, it's cheaper. Yes, exactly. Yeast exactly. samples. Yeah, I uh, I will be samples. sending you books. Nice. I will be sending you books. That's exactly you what books. I'll do. Uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, Ian, always uh, always fun hanging out doing this. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks to Adam on the Wheels of Steel. And uh, I just want to say that I would love to toast you out, but I, all of my cups are empty. Do we have anything still oh, open? Oh, man. Oh, there we go. Yep, That's a travesty. Some, uh, yes. Not just a little uh, bit of tequila. Have a, uh, have a wonderful week, my friends. Thank you for joining us uh, for Smoking and Toasting. Let me take a quick peek at the calendar so I can tell you uh, Ooh, what's happening. we got some good stuff coming up. Uh, next week. Oh, yeah. Alina from Garrison Brothers. Oh, nice. nice. On the show next week. Garrison Brothers next week. Yes. Woo. Yeah, so we will be counting the days.